everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alan, and on behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, while you're watching the opening credits, we too can see them in the studio and in, in, on the monitor. And it always just it just lifts me up to see that little boy's face. Actually, people always ask me, is that my son? But it, I'm like the godfather of that boy, and he's a, a good friend's uh, son. But, I mean, the joy of living, I mean, that's what this this human experience is, is about. And it's time that we really came into that joy of living, where, where love is the guiding force in our lives, where that manifestation of joy, of love, is the motivating force in our lives, where whatever you would call it, would you call it God, would you call it love, would you call it truth, but that is what is going to bring us together. That is what's going to take this human race and this human condition and rise it and raise it and rise it or whatever you would word you would use. I was in the wrong tense. But it's going to take us into a new experience, the experience that we know we want to have, the experience of, of connectedness, of oneness, of, of that feeling between all of us, no matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what religion, with the trees, with the dolphins, that feeling of love, that feeling of connectedness, and that is what, again, Bridging Heaven and Earth is about. For, you, for those of you who've been watching the show, and you know we're on all over the country now, we just found out this week that we're on uh, three times a week in Boulder, Colorado, which we're really excited about. But we have guests tonight who, once again, just bring their love in their own particular fashion, bring their inspiration, and, and allow all of us to share in that love and that inspiration. We have with us Louis Dord Dempre, who's a master teacher and author of an extraordinary new book called Dawn of Enlightenment that just, ex just explores his unbel almost unbelievable experiences in coming to that inspiration and in coming to that truth. And we also have with us Mary Bacon, who's been on before, and Stephanie Bennett. And they played with us before. Uh, Mary's a violinist and a songwriter. And her, 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 one of her CDs is Folk Favorites. And Stephanie is a harpist and a songwriter. And she has no, numerous uh, CDs, a story seldom told, and a new one coming out, uh, Bardina's Forest. So we're just excited. I mean, Mary and Stephanie have been with us before, and we received such an enthusiastic response that when we started this, this sixth season of ours, that uh, Mary and Stephanie were one of the first people we called, and this was the date we worked out. So we're just, you know, just delighted again to have Louie with us and Mary and Stephanie. And I think if you'll just allow us to, to be with you for the next 58 and a half or so minutes, uh, that an experience of, of that truth, of that love, will once again raise, rise, or just lift us all into a new experience of, of inspiration. So, as we normally do at this time, please join me in a short meditation. Just, if you know how to do a meditation technique, do it. If not, just try to follow your breath, just try to settle in. No matter what happened today, let it go. Let this hour of bridging heaven and earth, wherever you are, Whatever you've done, whatever you think is your life is about, let this hour take you. So please join me. Thank you very much. Uh, so please, we'd like to start tonight's show with uh, a, a piece by uh, Mary Barton. It's called October, and it's going to be performed by Mary and Stephanie Bennett. So whenever they're ready, please just settle into this hour. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Stephanie. That was beautiful. So I want to start with Louis Adore Dempree. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. So I got like a six, the thing that comes to mind is like a $64,000 multiple uh, choice uh, question <laughs> or multiple part. Now, go. I've heard you variously described as a living master, a living saint. Now, <laughs> what is the difference between the two? How do you become one or the other? I mean, just explain <laughs> this here because I'm sure our viewers would like to know, you know what all that means. Wow. $64,000 question. Well, let's see. Where to begin on this one? The way mastery is, is described is, well, I guess many, many people will describe it different ways. The way I would describe it and share it as has been shared with me and my understanding through the ways of spirit is that through the attaining of enlightenment or through one's transcending the state of living in separation or duality, there's a, an ongoing experience of living in in a oneness with God. Now, right away, people say, well, we're all God. Yes, that's true. Uh, in On the highest plane of creation, everyone is God. Everything is one. There's also something about the realized state of consciousness, what is one's ongoing daily experience. And, and whereas the easiest way I can sum it up for people is by saying, living in the experience, because everything is an illusion, as we know, living in the experience of separation, there's a force like gravity that keeps ones in a consciousness of separateness from the beloved, from the God or the love that one is inherently. And while living in that which is on this planet translates into a fear-based, which is either fear or faith, there's a gravitational pull that keeps one's consciousness in that illusion and ones have moments, varying moments of being in the oneness, physically experiencing, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, experiencing the oneness. Some people call the bliss, the rapture, whatever you want to call it. But because the collective critical mass of one's consciousness is still in separation, that gravity eventually pulls one back in. Now, through things like training and meditation and healing and purifying the body and all the different things people use, and for each person is different, there are more and more experiences in the life of an aspirant or a seeker that they gain access to more and more light, more and more divinity. But so long as the critical mass, more than 50% of their consciousness, is still in a fear-based or separate-based reality, that's what sustains them. And beyond that veil of separation, which is described as living mastery, it's the opposite. The gravitational pull is actually into the oneness because someone's consciousness is now united with um, its own inherent divinity. And there are, because everyone while embodied is still having initiations, initiation never ends, learning never ends, growth never ends. And while mo ones may have, myself included, experiences or moments of anger, sadness, fear, whatever, the collective critical mass within one's consciousness is in the oneness, is in its realized state of its own divinity. And thus, there's a gravitational pull that brings one back into that oneness. And those moments of separation are fleeting. So in other words, would you say that the momentum is more towards the oneness than to the... The pull, the, the pull. Yeah, the feel that one's consciousness lives in oneness and has moments of separation. Um, and the opposite, before crossing that threshold, it's the reverse. And do you get to 75 and you get to be a living saint? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how, does that, is that, no, I mean well, how does that work? I mean, is there, well, is there a difference? I well, mean, that's the, when you start talking about sainthood, it gets into... In a it, body. It gets, it gets, it can get very sticky. It gets very, it can get very sticky for people because then you start getting into the lines of, uh, our religions and dogmas being brought into this. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I, you know, I honor everybody's beliefs and feelings. Um, many people can say Some that, more than yes, others. no, I honor everyone's as the same, everybody. There's no one that has more God than anyone else. Inherently. So, yeah, inherently. So, um, for many people, it's, it can be very, it can be very relative. Many people, it's, a, it's a description because is it not so that if everyone is God, everyone doesn't always behave that way as pure, instead of saying God as pure love all the time. So there are, everyone has moments of doing things that we call saintly, saintly things. 
and some have more and more and more of it. So when and you cross the 50 no, no, to no. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm covering it. <laughs> you get so, okay. so um, there are ways of different ways of describing it. For instance, historically, sainthood was something decreed by the Pope or the Catholic Church that after a certain lifetime of demonstrations of saintly or godly, true lovingly acts and deeds and words, there would be a decree from the Church. And then in mo more modern times, it becomes the, the populace has, has deemed these words, like for instance, Paramahansa Yogananda is widely known as a saint, but there was not a decree from the Catholic Church. So what I say for people is let people um, get not caught up, don't miss the message for the means, you know, or don't get caught up in titles or labels, but just see the same thing I say to people wherever I go is, is someone a demonstration of love and the person decide for themselves because it all boils down to love. Now, it does so happen since you know, you're right here, zoomed in on me here. It does so happen that I am the full reincarnation of King Louis the Ninth, who was decreed by the Church as a saint, and I had numerous, numerous um, experiences of that lifetime and and accounts coming from many, many other people that have recognized me as that. People I've never met before have walked up to me, say, "I remember you. I recognize you as King Louis." I've had people write to me in French. He that, wasn't the one who was beheaded, huh? right? Huh? Oh. No, he died of the plague. Oh. Because so which, he looked forward yeah. to. <laughs> I don't know about yeah, that. Right. <laughs> I've had my own, my own plagues. Yeah, have we all? So, I mean, how how did you come into this experience? I mean, you started yeah. out a kid from Boston. <laughs> yeah, started out as a happy-go-lucky kid from Boston. Um, I always had a very powerful experience of. I was raised a Catholic, and I formally left the church at, at 13. That's when I got my business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was finished Yeah, I mean, I was very happy and content, but I just knew that my experience of God went beyond anything yeah, that, that could contain right, it. Right. So it wasn't that I had a, um, a problem, per se. It's just something else was calling and pulling me. Mm -hmm. It actually was a very deep pain in my heart because in my little human mind, I actually felt, you know, mentally that I was leaving God. Mm -hmm. And yet, right. and yet I remember... In the concept of what, yeah, because that's with what God yeah, was. Yeah, go to church, church and talk right. to God. And right. so while my soul was pulling me to seek, you know, beyond the limits of anything, not just that church, but anywhere, to find God in everything, there was a part of me that felt I was betraying. But I remember, and I, and I say this in my book too, that I had an experience of Jesus at five years old where he physically manifested in my room and talked to me for about 15 minutes. And the funny thing was, I never told anyone. I, I knew who he was. It was just a matter of fact. And little kids are very innocent and trusting. So I figured if he was coming to my room, he was going everyone's. Everyone. Right. <laughs> so it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> And he just was. It wasn't like, are you or not you? He just was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're sitting here. I don't go home saying, was Alan in that chair? Or Other, other no. people probably <laughs> are, though, however. It's okay. Right. So, um, so anyway, one of the things he said to me, I remember the two things he said to this day. He said, something will happen in a not-too-distant po point in your future that will actually make you feel that you're leaving me. And he said, it will break your heart in two. And I want you to know that when that happens, um, I was actually the one who instigated that. Right. It's actually me taking you, which of course I wouldn't remember till ad adulthood. And then the other thing he said was that at some point later in life, you're going to have a profound experience of me that will rock you off the foundation of your existence and it will change your life forever. And that, getting back more forward into your question, was what happened in the, in the big shift in me. I was pursuing an, an acting career in Hollywood and by my friends, um, accounts doing it very successfully. I'd been on television a great deal, done several films, did stand-up comedy, did impressions. And then in 1990, I had this powerful spiritual awakening where my crown just blew open and the gift of faith healing just awakened in my hands instantly. I mean, I touched someone, I could just see everything in their body and things were just getting healed. I mean, I didn't, I say I don't know how, I knew it was the power of God, of love, but I, I wasn't facilitating it. Like if someone said, oh, fix my whatever, I was like, well, I don't, it either happens or it doesn't. Right. And <laughs> so, um, and then I had a, I had a window when that bursting happened. There was a window of absolute total omniscience that 
was just, I couldn't shut it off. I didn't eat a morsel of food or sleep a wink for a solid week. And I couldn't. I was, there was so much current coming through me. I could see and hear anything about everyone. A car would go by and I'd see inside their body. I'd see their house. I'd see all their past lives. I'd see everything. And, and for the first two days, it was, I was like a kid in a candy store. And then at the third day, when I realized I couldn't shut it off and I couldn't sleep if I wanted to, it was very uncomfortable. And eventually it started to settle down. The, the healing stayed in my hands and has ever since. And, um, and then there was an opening in my, what we call the higher faculties, the extrasensory perceptions that stayed. It, it diminished a little, but it stayed on. And I started doing what most people would call psychic readings for people. I'd sit and hold their hand or a wallet or a chain and they just ask questions and I'd answer them. And this opening was followed by a year and a half um, of very powerful mystical experiences that defined as I mean, how would you describe um, near-death experiences I had encounters with off-planet beings what we call ETs I had encounters with divine beings angels and masters appearing in front of me talking to me taking me on journeys in my sleep it just was going on and many many revelations and prophecies just just unfolding before me without any there was nothing I was doing Excuse me, one of the things that I share is that I never had a, a teacher, a spiritual teacher, and I never read a book about anything metaphysical, just total greenhorn. And, and all this was happening. So after about a year and a half of this, I, I tried sharing a few stories with people. This is a real testimonial to the spiritual path. Are <laughs> you <laughs> being facetious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, here's somebody who didn't, no. wasn't really looking for it, and then, the, you know, like, I mean, we I had uh, a Julian. Looking, wasn't looking consciously. Right. But I mean, Julianne Everett told. I don't, do you know Julianne? I know the name. Yeah. But I don't. Know. I mean, she said that she was like a regular housewife, wasn't consciously looking. You know, just a regular person. All of a sudden, the top of her head blew up, yeah. and she was looking at the Akashic records and just reading of what, what it was it. like for me. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just. But obviously, the inner hunger. Yeah, the hunger right. and that gaze on what I call God had to be there. Yeah. Had to be there, right. even though consciously I wasn't aware of it. I mean, I I believe I always practiced to the best of my ability loving ways of being you know I didn't mm -hmm. like to kill animals and I didn't like to do things to people but I had all the same vices everyone else had maybe less of them but I mm -hmm. had them all and so after about a year and a half of this I started um, each night when I went to bed I would lie in bed and all I knew about heaven was Jesus Mary angels saints and God that's all I knew right. so I'd say dear God please send me someone who can tell me what's going on in my life my there's no one I can talk to and I don't know what's happening I did that every single night for three months just diligently and then um, after three months a lady friend I hadn't seen in almost a year was it almost uncomfortable at this point because there was no reference point for you no it, it was only uncomfortable in on the mental side of not knowing right. but the experiences were just was rapture I, mean, right. I would I was living in a world by myself that what was uncomfortable is that I couldn't share it with anyone mm -hmm. the experiences were not uncomfortable mm -hmm. And even on some level, my not knowing wasn't as uncomfortable. What was uncomfortable was that I had no one to talk to and no one to share it with and no one that would believe me. So after that prayer every night for three months, this lady friend called me. We had dinner and she said, oh, I, I want to introduce you to this group of women that were taking classes um, taught by this woman who channels the Ascended Masters. And no word of a lie, I said, what's an Ascended Master? Never heard the phrase before. Hmm. And she goes, well, you know, like Jesus. Said, oh, yeah, that I know. I yeah, know Jesus. You're familiar she goes, well, there's hundreds, thousands of them. And naturally, I believed her. I said, yeah, really? So I said, um, right away, my, my mind was saying, not interested. I don't want to go. And while I'm thinking no, my mouth said physically the word, yes, I'd love to, which I still don't know how that happened. I mean, I do. but right, <laughs> And so I went, and I saw this orientation for 10-week course, which I had no interest in. But as soon as I... Um, saw the woman it was a, like a lightning bolt hit me in the heart and I heard this little voice which I didn't know at the time said that's the person you've been asking for you need to meet this one so I had a private session and um, and in that experience with this woman I had never encountered um, channeling per se I'd heard of Edgar Casey, but that was about it and uh, in this session that lasted two and a half hours, Jesus came and, and spoke to me in St. Germain. Through and, her. Through her. And, and basically said, we've been waiting for you. 
I said, you came a little sooner than we expected, but... Very, said, always were a precocious <laughs> little thing. They said ambitious, but <laughs> you always were an ambitious one. So he said that you came into this world to be our messenger, to be a messenger and prophet, and we would like to train you. They said we would like to... It was St. Germain. They, they were... Well, St. Germain was the one speaking this, the Ascended Master St. Germain, and speaking for, on behalf of the Ascended Masters of the Great White Brotherhood, the Legions of Light, and... And he said, we would like to train you as an initiate in the ancient mystery school, the same one that was in Egypt and Lemuria and all these places and Atlantis. And he said, um, would you be willing to sign your life over and we will lift you out of your world, hone and refine you and put you back in as our emissary. Now at the time, my career was going great. I was in a very happy, healthy relationship. I was at probably the highest point in my life. And it's funny, people often at that time would say, oh, you're just depressed, you're lost, you're confused. I was just on top of the world at that mm -hmm. moment, which is usually, it's very different from many of the stories I hear people say about their awakening and their seeking. Right. It's usually like the way I describe it. For many people, God's the lender of last resort. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you go to him with everything else. Yeah. Really yeah. And the St. Germain once said to me, he goes, if, if God gave most people whatever, everything they wanted, we'd see the back of your heads. You, know? so, you, yeah, yeah. you leave skid marks. Right. Right. So it's like many people come to God figuring, well, if everything I tried on my own doesn't work, I'll try mm -hmm. God. So subtext, I can still get what I want. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, will you sign your life over? And I just, I had tears streaming down my face in this experience because their presence was so strong. I never knew this existed. And all I said was, where do I sign and how much does it cost? And as I said, I had my career going. I also had a massage practice and I was doing faith healings and psychic readings now for a year and a half. And he told me, put it all aside. He said, quit your practice, quit your this, quit that. Within, things started to disappear very quickly. Within six months, it was all gone. All my money was gone, my house, my career, my lover, my massage practice, my faith healings, it was all gone. Was that and a was, conscious effort on your part to the, unwind it? Or was uh, it just... <laughs> well, let, let's, well, let's, let's put it this way. way. Anything that I did not lovingly, willingly let go of, let go of me. It's like my soul made you know made a connection to its destiny and my quote this illusionary free will mechanism as i describe it didn't have a whole lot of say in it he might my mind might have thought it did but it really didn't so it just took over and then life life claimed me so that's how it happened and instantly they opened this portal in me and the masters were coming through me immediately on the next day it was it was activated and then over time many many changes happened so. All right, you know, maybe it's a good time to, uh, you know, take a little break and uh, listen to uh, the second set uh, with, uh, with Mary and Stephanie. So we're going to have uh, their second set. They're going to do two songs, uh, I Can Imagine, written by Stephanie and performed by Mary and Stephanie. And then what they're going to do, uh, Lover's Dream. Actually, the first one is from uh, uh, Stephanie's. This one, I can imagine, is from Stephanie's new album, Bardina's Forest. And then they're going to do uh, Lover's Dream. And that was written by Mary, and it's going to be performed by Mary and Stephanie. So whenever they're ready, I can imagine in Lover's Dream. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, man. That was magnificent. That was fantastic. So we're back with Louie on the set. Hi. So you were having all these incredible experiences and, and all the, the ascended masters, the masters, the <laughs> grand masters, no, no, the, the grand, they're the grand puba. Everybody was coming through you, like just a vessel for everything. So how did that lead you in your life to, how did you manifest those experiences? Um, well, uh, many things came from it and still do. I, one of the mainstays of my life now, which I, I know is going to be phasing out within about a year, is I have a private practice where people come for one-on-one -on -one sessions with myself and connecting to their own spirit guides and masters and angels and master teachers who physically presence themselves in my form. It's one of the, one of the services that I provide in my ministry. I also have classes and courses that I do, um, one day intensives, weekend spiritual retreats, and I take people on mystical journeys to what many people call the power places, Egypt, sacred Shasta, sites, sacred yeah. sites, uh -huh. and lead mystical journeys there. And, and many times prophecy and revelation comes forth there that's never been written, things that come right off the Akashic record. And, there, and uh, many times we witness um, quite spectacular miracles, including the commanding of elements or the weathers come in and weather comes in and things happen and earth moves and it's pretty astounding. And, uh, and also, as of last year, my writing branch of my ministry began. My first book is now done. And that's and the Dawn of Enlightenment. Dawn of Enlightenment. Right. And it's first in a potentially yeah. long series, yeah. you would say. Yeah, I'll be writing at least 13 books. I already, in fact, the other day I woke up, I was in a meditation in the morning and Yogananda came to me. He's one of, one of the beings who guides me primarily at this time and he downloaded into me my next 15 books title and contents just in about two minutes i just took them all down and i was just looking at them so now he says you got some well that's super you got some super to, computer yeah, so I said, that's a big download things to do right. so um and this is supposed to be done by like christmas yeah by christmas basically the next so, yeah and this one is not a thin book yeah. so there's yeah. a lot of a lot of information. Yeah. Now, this, 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 what he gave me, will probably span a 10 to 15 year window. I know that there are going to be some, there's a period of time where I'll be writing exclusively. Right now, wearing a hundred different hats, it's uh, part of, I'm sure, more of the stripping away and the surrendering to get in a place where I'm the most accessible to be used by God as more and more of my personal life, you know, gets surrendered unto the greater story of my soul. And also, what came about last year was the beginning of um, moving into greater outreach into the public with doing a lot of international conferences that many authors and teachers and speakers go to. So I travel the world doing these conferences and doing our retreats around the world. And, and we're filming in uh, in uh, March or February, when is February, February of 99, and you have something planned for you know, the January 1st or December 31st, um, yeah. 1990, the, the, the millennium. millennium yeah, it's, Why don't you tell it, people about that? It's quite an, quite an interesting uh, scenario. I was given this vision in 1992 by St. Germain, and he planted it as a seed within me that at the moment of the millennium, that somehow some essence of God would speak through me in front of the entire planet, and I'm thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> we don't have that big an audience yet, yeah. so it's, gonna, so it's not here. have to be on the Larry King <laughs> neither, show. I neither, think. neither did I. Right. So um, even now, there's probably only a few thousand people that have ever even heard of me. So yeah, you, you, can, you can imagine, and <laughs> well, God, what God does. It's really not my exciting. job. So I often tell people that that ask me questions about their own life. I say, look, if it's God's plan, let Him worry about it. Right, Just right. serve. Just Mine there. is not to to figure out God's will, simply to serve it. Right. So Saint Germain planted the seed in me, and he told me, "Just leave it there." He said, "In order for a vision to manifest on the physical plane, it needs a container to hold it." He said, "So your your physical embodiment is actually a container that's the seed is sprouting in and it's gestating. Growing. It's growing." And he said, "In." just be detached it may never happen it may whatever forget all about it which I did and then last year in May um, I was up in Mount Shasta for the Wisak festival and in California and all of a sudden one morning Sai Baba just appeared in my room he, the masters often physically manifest in front mm -hmm. of me and and Sai Baba appeared in front of me and he said well do you remember that vision in 92 he said well it, it was real and yes it will be through you it's going to happen and he said uh, that your soul and St. Germain and I are the 
triad of souls that are producing this in the etheric and and you're the link to manifest it in the physical and many other people will come in and he said this thing has a soul and a life of its own so just serve it and lay your life down for it and there was a, a cavalcade of miracles and revelations that kind of led me on an obstacle course and it wound up um, beginning to look like it would be in LA in Hollywood the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and then a string of occurrences happened which ended up leading us to New Zealand which I later found out is the first time zone on the planet and so I was doing an Australian New Zealand tour last fall October November December and St. Germain came to me on the airplane He just fell into my body when I was crossing the international date line he came into me the plane was filled with violet light tears were streaming down my face and he said oh by the way it'll be in New Zealand and and he told me in the town of Christ, and it is going to be the millennium this event where, and you're going to reveal um, to so, masses the multitude <laughs> well sermon there'll, in the zoo, yeah, there'll be a, a message of global peace that I will deliver and and um, it'll be what it'll be and who sees it sees it and I'm on total faith I, I have myself know nothing let thy will be done but I just followed the guidance God was giving me and I was told get on a plane go to Christchurch New Zealand and and rent a theater there were eight theaters to look at I think six or eight and I didn't know what to do and just things miracles were happening and I was told rent this theater put your money down on it so I put thousands of dollars down which I didn't really have and for, and for December 31st for December 31st yeah. 1999 yeah and so now the vision of this uh, the vision for this event is that it's going to be a a slice of life it's going to show heaven on earth and and to show the world that we do live in paradise now there's this there's a uh, a theme that runs in the minds of humanity about you know the new age is coming and it's I call it the it's coming disease mm -hmm. you know we'll all ascend in 2012 when the Mayan calendar ends in 2013 and the golden age when the mothership lands everything is it's coming that's all separation that's all no moment lives beyond the confines of itself it's also universal law that whatever we place our focus upon will become form follows thought simple physics so while many many benefits and programs as beautiful as they are are either talking about what's coming which doesn't keep us present in our now body now state on the planet or they want to um, ingratiate the hearts of humanity to themselves by showing all the filth and corruption we're polluting the streams and killing people we've got to stop fighting we've got to heal the planet but we're pulling all the focus onto filth and disease which creates more of it uh -huh. because every thought if each person is God if I'm all that is you are all that is every time someone invokes a thought the full power of creation comes into them and sends it into the universe and the universe being but a boomerang multiplied magnetizes and and multiplies that tenfold so we're using our own divinity to create more disease and pestilence so the vision that Saint Germain gave me is let us show the world heaven as earth now and as people get a chance to see that there is tons of beauty goodness wholeness love art joy music that that will hold the focus it doesn't it's different than denial Pollyannic denial it's saying yes we understand that there are ills on the planet that m many beings live outside of the continuum of pure love at the same time let's not lose sight of the fact that we are a beautiful race and we have much beauty and wonder and let's let that be the bastion that holds us and feeds us the wellspring that feeds us so we can walk in the world and deal with the other things and so the again the ideal the vision is to have as many different peoples cultures languages dances musics arts represented and just and, and film footage if we can of the most beautiful places on the planet off the planet underwater everything how large this event goes I don't know I mean we we've seen people get very close to this and there's a fire in this this event that's an it's a real incinerator and and I've seen people come in and then drift out and just it, it's something that can't even be held or touched it's like we can be warmed by it but if anyone tries to hold it it just burns their hands off or if anyone fears it it, it won't have them and so I'm sitting here watching this undulating morphing growing thing knowing nothing except God says this shall be and so it shall so so when you say uh, when you get information from Ger Saint Germain say you say God says I mean is that do you make that connection um, well 
Yes, yes and no. I mean, <clears throat> the ascended masters, the angels and saints, they are divine beings. I have, I have a very powerful connection consciously to them. Everyone's powerfully connected to them because we are them. I describe the, if you look at the universal law as above, so below, if we are the many aspects of God on earth, then all the ascended realm, the divine hierarchies are the many aspects of God in heaven, but they're all parts of the one. So if God is an enormous crystal that has a billion facets, every ascended master, every human being, every animal is another facet of the one. So yes, it's they, and yet on a, on a lesser plane of creation, they do exist. On the highest plane of creation, it's all one, it's all love. And as we go into lower densities, we, we do, there is a hierarchy that goes to, you know, from absolute zero to absolute 100%. So, so would you say, I mean, like in essence, the spirit, so they're real and they're not at the same time. So it's like that razor's edge. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're real and you're not at the same time. Everything is energy. So, I mean, the same way I say that, yes, Saint Germain is real and he's an aspect of God, he's also a being called Saint Germain. I mean, and he's an aspect of me, same as you. I mean, you exist, you're sitting here, but on the highest plane of creation, everything outside of self is a projected hologram of the many aspects of self. So mm -hmm. you are real and at the same time, you're an aspect of me because nothing outside of self exists. So, I don't know if that answers your question. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's as good as any. This is true. I it could have gone a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, so, do you do you see the the momentum picking up for you know that uh, we've had a lot of people on the show talk about that? What if for whatever reason there's more help now? There's more energy now to to break through the density. Oh, absolutely. So you feel that that's part of like your whole life's work or surrender, however you know we're using words. Right. So you yeah. always run into some kind of crap all of yeah. So do you see that momentum really picking up as you travel the world and all? There's a huge momentum picking up. And the interesting thing is, it's not simply in a metaphysical community or the New Age community or what people would ostensibly recognize as the seeker. It's, it's all pervasive because what's happening now is, is the light quotient is continuing to increase on the planet and more veils are lifting between the realm of spirit and the realm of matter. It's what's also happening is because of these factors, many people are discovering that the par the paradigms they lived within no longer work. People that had their whole life slick, down pat, mastered business, mastered my relationship, people's floors are crumbling. The people that call me in for private sessions now, it's astounding the content, the nature of what people are saying that people are feeling their their foundation become quicksand and the more they try to hold it or control it the faster it goes so there is definitely an alchemical shift in the planet out of fear into love and um, I describe it it's it's too much to get into a one-word thing here but it's basically on some levels it's like the dissolution of the free will zone you know free will as basically the way I describe it is a divine dispensation given to all of us as we as God consciously freely chose to enter the illusion of separation we were given this this dispensation God said to us well if you as God want to have this experience enter separation for the purpose of rediscovering and experiencing yourself as God then while you're there and you're going to enter this lost zone by your own choice I'll give you this little tool called free will you can use it anytime you want to find your way back into love but what happened is because of the selfishness and self-centeredness and the fear, people use the free will as, as a, you know, a toy, like, you know, thanks for the Cadillac, God, I'll call you when I need you. So this mechanism that was designed as a homing device, we act humanity actually used to go further from God. You know, I, I stole Aladdin's lamp, now I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But it was really sent to bring everyone back. So how would so, you describe, would you so say that... So that's dissolving now. Would you say that you possess free will at this mm -hmm. time? Free will is never taken away from anyone, but the way I describe it for myself, the highest use of free will is, to, is in surrendering. surrendering it to God's will. And people go, well, I am God's will. In theory, yes, everyone is God's will, but everyone is not realized in the physical day-to-day -day life. When, when the personal self, the selfish sense-gratifying desires are more and more surrendered, then the union between God's will and human will gets closer and closer, and eventually, they do become one, because in spirit they were always right. one. 
So when I describe the dissolution of that zone, it's that, to put it in layman's terms, it's becoming less and less viable and possible for people to use free will to make choices outside of the continuum of pure love on this planet. That, you know, at some dis dis undisclosed point in the future, which I wouldn't say even if I knew because then the mind would attach to it and then wait for that. <laughs> right. But eventually what this planet will see is a point where choices made outside of love cannot even sustain life. You know, we're talking about They'll just to fall from their own weight. Well, the truth is, they won't even that they won't even happen because it's again, even that is speaking in a linear right. term of. I mean, our whole language is linear. Right. It's almost impossible to put concepts into language because language, by nature, is linear. But it's basically the dissolution of the fear zone and 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 the strengthening of the love zone. So I mean, basically, we're coming out of fear into love. Yeah, and that's happening to. Everybody, whether they're yeah. conscious, unconscious about it, right. it's just the nature of like the evolution right. now. And yes, and the free will mechanism is the valve, the barometer we have, or a governor. We can speed up the process or slow it down. It's not a question of if; it's a question of when. Right. Everyone's right. destiny is oneness in, right. in love That's, and God. That, exactly. Yeah, it's the return to oneness. So, all right. Well, I guess you know, we've, <laughs> we've done it again. It's uh, another show, and I hope that you had fast. the yeah that went really fast, and I hope you had. You know the same kind of experience I did. I mean, and just the, the studio audience, I could just see the vibration, and just see the the inspiration that we've all had. So we just want to really thank uh, Louis for coming, and and thank Stephanie you. and Mary, and just thank you all for watching, and thank you for all your calls. I'd also like to thank Tim at Montecito del Mar for putting up Stephanie and Mary. So good night. God bless you. Thank you. Come again. Good night. <laughs>